Before we get started, I want to give two big shout outs to our amazing sponsors, Technology Partners and Kitty Academy, who is serving St. Louis healthcare and essential businesses in this time of crisis. We appreciate you so much. So let's get started and meet our amazing panelists. They're gonna introduce themselves, starting with Jim Maxwell. Thank you, Tabitha, and thanks everybody who are uh, joining the uh, webinar. Um, I uh, grew up in Southern Illinois in Belleville and uh, went to Belleville East High School, moved to uh, West County to Maryland Heights in 2001, then out to Chesterfield, which is where I currently live. I've been in the recruiting industry, search industry for 22 years. I joined Westport One uh, 22 years ago, started out as a junior associate recruiting software salespeople, and then in uh, 2018 bought into the firm and am now the managing director. Our, really our focus um, and our mission uh, at Westport One is to really help companies build uh, world-class teams and just get great opportunities in front of great talent. So I thank you guys for allowing me to speak. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim. And now we're going to go to Charlotte. Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Charlotte Hammond, and I am the president and CEO of Challenge Unlimited. Uh, I've been with the organization since 2006. Uh, my background is in finance uh, prior to coming to the organization, and I actually started here as the uh, CFO of the organization and uh, a couple of years ago I was actually uh, appointed by the board of directors as their new CEO and president. Uh, our organization is a multifaceted uh, company uh, with over a thousand uh, uh, employees that work for us across five states. Our main location is in the uh, metro east area uh, where we provide um, group homes for individuals with significant disability, but we also provide a lot of what we call facility maintenance services from custodial, groundskeeping, food service, um, commissary work, uh, but we hire people with significant disability to perform that work. So that gives them an opportunity uh, to get into the community, uh, to work uh, that a lot of times they've never had uh, or had challenges in uh, securing uh, job opportunities. Uh, I'm happy to be a part of the panel today, uh, which gives me an opportunity to give you a perspective uh, from the uh, uh, from the nonprofit uh, space, uh, but also uh, kind of a crossfit between uh, not just nonprofit, but what we call social entrepreneurial. So again, glad to be on the panel. We're glad to have you, Charlotte. And Lauren Herring. Hi everybody, good morning, I'm Lauren Herring, I'm CEO of Impact Group, and we are a global career management firm, headquartered here, but operating all around the world and uh, supporting Fortune 500 and uh, small and mid-sized companies uh, all over. Um, we specialize in career coaching and leadership development coaching, so our main services are outplacement, relocation support, uh, where we're helping the accompanying spouse in a relocation uh, for a corporation find employment in the new area. And then we also do leadership development support. Um, the other thing that I am excited to share in addition to my work at Impact Group is that for the last year and a half, I've been writing a book on the job search process. And who would have known that it is uh, such unfortunately good timing for that, um, but that will be coming out in May, and it is called um, Take Control of Your Job Search, The 10 Emotions You Must Master to Land the Job. And it is specifically on the emotional impact of the job search and how you can manage your emotions to best uh, put yourself out there. That's amazing, Lauren, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, we have Tony Furman. Good morning. I'm very glad to be here. Um, Director of Employment and Training for Madison County. We administer the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act funds for counties, Madison, Bond, Jersey, and Calhoun counties. If you're not familiar with Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act funds, it is uh, 
funded through the Department of Labor uh, at the federal level. We provide job training services for both individuals and also provide funding for training services for our companies. Um, we also provide things we call universal services, especially in this day and age where we can help individuals create resumes or update resumes and also work with businesses to bring in new talent, uh, help them recruit talent. Madison County Employment and Training is one of six uh, agencies throughout the St. Louis area that provide these Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act funds. Also on the Illinois side, St. Clair County Intergovernmental Grants as St. Clair County and four surrounding counties. On the Missouri side, the city of St. Louis slight administers those funds within the city. St. Louis County Workforce Development Agency in the county, St. Charles Workforce Development Agency in St. Charles County, and then Jefferson and Franklin County as their uh, entity as well. So I'm very glad to be here and look forward to the conversation. We're excited to have you, Tony. Thank you to all of our panelists for spending your morning on our webinar sponsored by Technology Partners and Kitty Academy. Please remember to our guests tuning in to submit your questions via the chat and we will answer them throughout the presentation or at the end of the conversation, however that pans out to be. So let's jump in. We've heard a lot about industries getting hit hard at this time. Some are obvious, such as tourism and restaurants, but there may be some uh, that surprise you. So Lauren, I'm gonna turn to you first. Can you share with us some of the industries that you've seen most impacted by COVID in the region? Sure, well, one of the things that has just come up in the last uh, couple days is the announcement by uh, Washington University, unfortunately, about the furloughs. And one of the things that I read in the chancellor's letter yesterday that was really interesting, in addition to obviously the shutting down of the university before graduation, uh, but the primary loss that they're experiencing is due to the uh, medical school. And they have reported that revenues at the medical school and in the healthcare industry are down about uh, 60% because of all of the elective uh, procedures that are being postponed due to uh, COVID. So I thought that was very interesting that um, you know, obviously we're aware of how the medical industry is so overwhelmed right now, but uh, the, the, the main revenue source for that industry is actually drying up. Um, and so that's a, a curious situation. Uh, another thing that I just uh, thought is important to bring up that a lot of companies uh, that might be on the edge one way or the other where it's not an obvious struggle for the companies that are receiving the payroll protection uh, loans, um, this is something that's very interesting that a lot of companies are actually struggling with figuring out how to spend that money. Um, in the hospitality industry, for example, I'm familiar with a local company that uh, is shut down right now, but 75% of the payroll protection funds are supposed to go towards actually um, uh, employee salaries. But if you're shut down because you can't have customers, it's very difficult to be able to employ those funds. So that's something that I think as the further um, iterations of these uh, congressional acts come out, it, it, I think there's some opportunity to evaluate how organizations are using those funds as well. Wow. Um, lots of great information there. <laughs> so let me turn to Jim. Westport One is a very diverse background in a lot of industries that are directly affected by COVID, some of which Lauren just alluded to. Um, can you share some insights as to what you've seen as it relates to workforce? Certainly can. Um, the areas that I have really seen be hit the hardest is the first one in manufacturing especially manufacturers that are focused in the automotive industry and in the capital equipment areas. Um, these manufacturers have been met with um, cash, really cash preservation strategies um, with furloughs, shift eliminations, and even plant closures. Um, in addition, um, we also focus in the finance area and um, with the local finance area banking, um, more specifically, they've kind of 
uh, obviously shut down their lobbies and whatnot. And so all your banking has to either go through ATM or go through the um, drive through. But uh, from an employee perspective, they've also been met with furloughs, um, working from home. And um, I know in one instance with one bank here in the St. Louis area, they're actually asking their employees to self quarantine every 14 days. Mm -hmm. So you're getting, you're getting paid, you're not being furloughed, but you're self quarantining and they kind of rotate their entire staff over a two week, you know, rolling two week period of time. Well, it's, it's, that's a unique way yeah. to maintain, to maintain your, your staff and keep them safe at the same time. Um, okay. So then let's, let's talk about the other side of the spectrum on industries that are thriving. Tony, I'm going to turn to you. Can you share what you're observing within the industries? Um, and, and I'm sorry, within, within your market of the industries that are thriving. Sure. People, I mean, we're hearing over and over and over again about the number of people being unemployed. I know this week the numbers just came out this morning and it was 4.4 million again last week nationwide. But there are industries hiring. On our Madison County Employment and Training website, we have a listing of local employers who have openings and we're up to 40 employers in our area who have openings. Um, some are the ones that you would expect in retail. I mean, the food industry, the grocery stores, uh, restaurants looking for delivery people, but the big industry in our area is transportation, distribution, and logistics. We have a number of the warehouses in our area desperate for employees to help ship out all those products. As retail is closed, e-commerce is bigger and bigger now, so they need those employees. I mean, some areas that we're seeing, Jim's talking about manufacturing going down. We're seeing manufacturers who were desperate for employees when we had a three-point unemployment rate still looking for employees to help in their manufacturing process. So I think the manufacturing is very specific to the industry that they're involved with. The other one we're seeing is uh, our mass transit system. They were looking for bus drivers. They were looking for uh, uh, diesel mechanics before. Those opportunities are still there. It's, uh, as you're talking, everybody's heads are just bobbing. <laughs> and Charlotte really had it going there. So can you, can, can you give us some, some color around the, the... Um, Wait, Charlotte? <laughs> well, um... You know, right before uh, or right after uh, the governor of Illinois um, issued their uh, stay at home order, um, we actually met with our sales team. Uh, we have uh, quite a few salespeople to ensure that uh, our uh, individuals, individuals with disability continue to work. And so, um, you know, there was some talk around the room. Uh, so maybe we need to um, maybe uh, put things on hold um, because a lot of businesses are shutting down. And uh, we had a very robust conversation that this is not the time to shut down. This is time to reevaluate our approach and uh, possibly have a different approach of how we sell. And so about two weeks ago, we actually secured a, uh, a very sizable um, contract uh, in the um, secondary contract packaging uh, industry, putting uh, about 15 individuals to work every day. Uh, they're supplying uh, cleaning uh, products and other products to Amazon. And so uh, because we didn't shut down, because we kept looking for those opportunities, and I actually have something on my wall and I have to turn around right quick. And it says, in the midst of every difficulty, uh, lies an opportunity from Albert uh, uh, Einstein. So again, um, there's a, again, uh, for us not to shut down, for us not to close our minds to how do we change our uh, approach uh, to how we sell, how do we find those opportunities, where are those industries that are still uh, looking for individuals to move their products. And so again, two weeks ago, secured a very sizable contract putting 15 individuals to work, again, uh, infusing uh, uh, dollars and revenue into our mission. Uh, so again, that's just, again, one of the successes of the organization thus far. I love that. Um, and that's a perfect segue into my next question, which I'm going to start with Jim, but I'd like Lauren and Tony to, to chip in. 
what what have you witnessed um, as it as it pertains to industries or specific companies that have adjusted their business model to create new revenue streams? Well, from a manufacturing perspective, many of the manufacturers that were making um, capital equipment or making our you know, manufacturing products uh, have kind of shifted their product focus into uh, making PPE equipment um, for the healthcare industry. Um, for one major win, I guess, in that category is Zone Enterprises here in St. Louis. They're headquartered down on Banneventer in the city. And historically, they've been making gaskets and rubber seals, mostly fo focused on the um, automotive industry. And they created an entire product line practically overnight. So you got to love the innovation there, um, making face shields for PPE equipment and that company right now, if you go to their website, they're hiring all over the place trying to fund uh, or actually trying to staff up rather uh, that entire business, that new product line for them. Sorry, this is, yeah, sure. Um, uh, one of the uh, ways that I heard one of the local, the large local companies uh, innovate is Edward Jones. Um, obviously, they're a company that is very busy right now, being right in the thick of managing people's uh, livelihoods and, and their retirements. So lots of people that are um, uh, struggling with trying to understand what's happening to their, uh, their investments. Um, but they also recognize that people right now, especially a lot of their clientele, is not just concerned about their investments, they're really concerned about their, uh, their health and their wellness. Uh, a lot of their clients are in that target market, or in, that, um, in, in the, the group that is at the highest risk for uh, being a little older in age. So they created a website literally in less than a week that focused on an entire uh, wellness approach to uh, emotional health, physical health, and financial health uh, to support their clients in a more holistic way than just focusing on what's going on with people's finances, which initially, of course, with the market's downturn, uh, that was the primary focus that many of their financial advisors thought to, to target. But they recognized, you know what, there's a, a bigger issue going on here. We need to address the whole person and the whole client. Love that. Tony, is there anything that you have seen? Is I it really? I think piggybacking on what Jim said, um, we're seeing, you know, the big push the last few years were with microbreweries. Those have been developed. Uh, a lot of them are tied to restaurants. The restaurants are closed. They're just providing takeout service. So they've converted the, their distilling operations into making hand sanitizer. I know the one close to me in Collinsville is making it and then giving it away, not even charging people for it, but. Love that, I love that. Um, and that, that segues perfectly into our next topic about the human impact. So Lauren, your background speaks very well to this topic. Can you share with us some insights on what you're seeing as how it relates to leadership? How are you as CEO of Impact Group communicating with your, your employees and leading through this time? Yeah, my situation is actually even a little bit more unique than uh, being CEO during a crisis. I'm actually in the midst of a maternity leave as well. So I have an eight week old and I knew that my maternity leave as a owner and CEO would not be the traditional time off, but I certainly didn't expect this. Um, nonetheless, it's important to stay present. And so I've been connecting with people uh, both from a video perspective, I have sent out a couple videos, uh, as well as um, just taking the time to make personal outreaches uh, to people. Um, the, the other thing that uh, is core to what we do at Impact Group is supporting people through change. So in our outplacement practice, we also provide a service that we call Leading Through Change, which supports the people that are staying within the organization. So um, obviously we know there's a lot of furloughs and layoffs going on right now, um, but 
uh, it's important for the leaders of organizations to stay very present and um, make sure they're communicating a clear vision about what's going on, where they're going, uh, over communicate. And so mm -hmm. these are the kinds of things that we often share with our clients. Um, the other thing that we make sure that managers are prepped on is that you wanna make sure that you're recognizing your team who's still there. And how do you make sure that you're, um, uh, for the people who are probably working even harder than they were before, because there's fewer people, that uh, you're recognizing their work and you're managing your retention risk as well. So your top performers, you wanna make sure you're staying very close to them. We suggest what we call a stay interview so that a leader is connecting with their uh, remaining staff, especially your high performers, to understand uh, why, are, why do you stay here? What's interesting about this job to you? What do you wanna do? What's, what are your career ambitions? And so how can you even use this pause in our economy right now to help people uh, take on new challenges for their career to set them up for the future even better? Mm -hmm. That's, you said it perfectly, absolutely perfectly. Um, which I see a lot of head bobbings around you. <laughs> Tony, Charlotte, or Jim, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? I think the only thing that I would um, add to that is really just to, um, I guess, rephrase what um, has been said already, which is communication is like totally key. This is not the time as a leader to be quiet. Um, over communicating um, with your team is vitally important. Um, we talk to all kinds of companies where um, employees are totally confused about what their prospects are and the people who are doing the best in this environment are those companies where the leadership has communicated with the staff, with all of their employees, whether they're furloughed um, or they're working from home to um, of what the plans are going forward. So I just want to mention that oh, communication is just totally key. The only thing I would say, uh, Tabitha, was it's just the video that uh, that you're going to share later after this uh, webinar, uh, just to help with the communication to to their teams, and I think which is key if they're working from home. And even if they're working in the office, and I'll just give you an example, there are people that still we kind of stagger our presence here in the office, but you know, when we get up from our desk or our office space, we have to walk around with masks. So you, you just have to imagine <clears throat> the, um, uh, uh, some of the, um, I guess, uh, stress that comes with that of having to walk around with masks, which is our new normal. So again, everything that we do, we, we, we give them uh, kind of the, uh, what I call the support behind that from either the CDC guidelines, sometimes our, ours might be a little bit more strenuous uh, of our protocols of how do we continue to keep you safe. And so again, everything is about their safety. So as long as we communicate, and, and to Jim's point, as long as we're communicating why we're doing things, I, I know that makes a difference uh, in, in folks' stress levels. So let's talk about the stress levels and um, cost reduction efforts, because this this seems to be a common trend, um, as, as Lauren alluded to earlier with Washington University, and there have been a, a plethora of other companies that have either furloughed or laid off or, or just looked at the way that they're redoing their business model. Um, so when they can adjust when, when we get back into this um, new normal, which is a term that I just hate. <laughs> but um, so as we, as we look at cost reduction efforts, Jim, I'm gonna jump to you on this one. Can you share some insider information that you're privy to regarding these topics? So um, we actually conducted a survey of clients on what they've been doing to avoid, um, or actually to in cost reduction efforts. Everything is geared toward cash preservation at this point. And um, so there's been a, a pretty much a recurring theme with just about everybody that we surveyed. So cash retention strategies, um, the first thing that they've been doing is suspension of things like car allowances, travel and entertainment expenses, um, suspension of 401k matches for a time. 
Um, then they'll move on to things like hiring pauses where they're just not going to bring on any new um, employees and any new salaries in a particular period of time. Um, then they'll follow that with reduction in management and executive pay. Some of the companies have been um, doing a, a, a pay cut across the board. Uh, again, just for a short time, maybe 60 days, maybe 90 days. But uh, a lot of a majority of the clients, the executives and the managers have been taking the pay cut, but the people who are non-management haven't necessarily been taking that pay cut. So, so um, kudos to them on, on that situation. Um, the next, the, the next move would be to move into furloughs and companies in the manufacturing industry and in construction, they've certainly been doing that. And then um, in the manufacturing industry, uh, they eliminate shifts. They may run three shifts and they may just reduce that down to, to two shifts or even reducing um, the hours on that shift from maybe an eight hour shift to a six hour shift. Wow, so plenty of options. Yes. Which, which is always a positive. Um, Tony, Lauren, or Charlotte, did you want to add anything that you've seen as it relates to cost reductions? Uh, we did quite a bit of uh, reassignment uh, of duties. Uh, some mm -hmm. folks, uh, in order to not lay off individuals, if we didn't, if we had any other options, uh, we had openings. And so we made those jobs available for uh, individuals to uh, get reassigned into those uh, opportunities. So again, it could be totally different from any of your current responsibilities, but it gave individuals a chance to keep earning a paycheck. And so uh, that's been, we've gotten a lot of, again, I think uh, Lauren actually talked about why do people stay? And so that was one of some of the feedback that we've gotten from people saying, you know, we're, we're glad to still have a job because I know a lot of people who have been laid off and not collecting a paycheck so that you've made these options available. So again, I, I think it, it, it puts a lot into what we call the, uh, uh, the retention bank uh, for people to say, um, you know, this is why I, I like working for this company. This is why I want to stay. This is why I want to give my best. So again, um, we didn't lay off people where we didn't have to. Uh, and so we try to give other options is, if, as best, you know, as possible. Well, so those who are laid off or furloughed or, or out of a job, um, let's talk about the job hunting process. And Lauren, I'm going to give you a chance to, to plug your book again here. <laughs> so I'm going to start with you and, and tell me, how do you think, like, what do you, what do you think the landscape's going to look like? for job hunting? Well, obviously there's gonna be a lot more people looking for jobs right now. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the recovery looks like because obviously we anticipate that businesses will start slowly opening up more. And so does that mean that everyone is gonna rush out or are people gonna to continue to stay socially distant, which will mean the economy continues to slow down a little bit. So, um, I think there's a lot of unknowns about how this recovery is going to be, and that uncertainty obviously plays more on the fears of of people um, going through this process. My uh, best advice to job seekers is to focus on two things. Number one, as you get started on a job search, I uh, and I write about this in my book that the the best place to start is focusing on your brand. And a lot of times people think initially about uh, resume and resume is part of that. But nowadays brand means so much more, especially with um, the online presence. And uh, when there are so many people out on the market, how are you really going to differentiate yourself and make sure that you're positioning yourself as the solution to a company's problems? And uh, when I think about branding, it is uh, first and foremost uh, thinking about uh, who are you at your best and what are the greatest strengths that you bring to an organization that you wanna make sure come across loud and clear and that you're hitting on consistently throughout your networking and your interviewing. And uh, by focusing on brand and remembering who you are at your best, 
uh, that comes back to that emotional impact as well, because even when things are difficult and when you're down or you're frustrated or you're fearful that you'll never get a job again, you can come back to who, who's made you that, uh, those pieces of you that have made you successful in your past and remember that you'll be successful again. And so branding has that effect of uh, the, the personal confidence boost, as well as being uh, critical for your job search. And then the other piece is on networking. And I can't stress this enough, because there's such a focus on social distancing right now, I think there's gonna be a lot of people that are thinking, oh, let me just stay online and click, 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 send application. But the best thing that you can do is find ways to be personally networking in a socially distant way, uh, because we know from data that people who are recommended into a job through networking are 10 times more likely to land a job than the person who just applies through an online app. And so making sure that you are finding your way into hiring managers, HR leaders, people that can put your name forward are going to be absolutely critical to differentiate you as a job seeker, you know, if that's uh, the situation you're in. Love it. I love it. Jim, um, how about you? You're, you are a recruiting firm. <laughs> so what does 2020 look like for you and possibly even into 2021? Well, Lauren made some excellent points. Um, you know, we've had such a robust economy for nearly a decade at this point, and many of the people who find themselves displaced because of layoffs um, are going to find them in an unknown world where, in the past, getting a job was actually pretty easy um, because companies just couldn't find anybody. And now you end up in a situation where you may, like Lauren mentioned, you may end up with a serious amount of competition. And one thing I would tell job seekers at this point is that it may take a while to land a job. And so what I would suggest if I was sitting down with somebody is the first thing they need to do is they need to stay positive and get organized. Um, in the 22 years I've been in recruiting, I've been through three downturns, um, this one being the third one, um, and a serious one just like it was in 2009 and 2010. And so people are gonna get discouraged. So you need to stay, uh, stay positive and um, get organized with your job search. I would use this time to really do a career evaluation um, and figure out what exactly it is that you do. Companies don't hire people just to be hiring people. Companies hire people because they can solve problems for them or they can gain opportunities. And so I would look back at my professional career and find those stories literally where I've done that, where I've saved money, or I've gathered, grasped opportunities um, for my previous companies. And that's really gonna be my message um, when I'm out there posting things on LinkedIn or maybe even on Facebook. Um, and, and that brings me into social media. You wanna make sure, and, and this goes right into what Lauren was talking about as far as brand. You need to make sure that um, things that you're putting on your resume and things that you have on LinkedIn are pretty consistent. You don't wanna have one look totally different than the other. Um, with respect to your brand and social media, I, I don't think I have to go say this, but if you have embarrassing things on Facebook, probably you shouldn't make that accessible to the public because companies are checking those things and they're gonna check them even more as more and more candidates become available. Um, again, to Lauren's point, start networking. Um, you know, you have to do it in a socially distant world. Um, so you can certainly do that. Um, on LinkedIn, there's a lot of groups you can be a part of. You can connect with past colleagues. You can connect with past colleagues on Facebook. And Lauren was right on target when we talk to people um, about the, the best jobs that they've ever gotten. They've all gone through their networking approaches or through search firms. Um, very few of them tell, tell me about their greatest job ever coming off a monster board or career builder when they applied to it. One thing that people really need to get used to is virtual interviewing is going to be the new norm now, and it's going to be the rule now. Most people don't understand how to do that. And uh, my suggestion is that there's plenty of platforms out there that you can sign up for free and start practicing with your friends and your family or maybe mentors um, 
or if you're working through a search and recruiting firm, we do practice video interviewing. We prepare all of our people for video interviews because it's just a new world and there are certain um, things that you have to be aware of when you're doing a video interviewing because that's gonna be happening from home in most cases. Um, let's see here. So one thing that I would also mention is if you happen to be in a lower income situation, you're gonna to have to understand that probably you're gonna be looking for a job online. And unfortunately, many of those folks may not have the technologies associated um, with that. And I, I think Tony probably has some good insight into this, but um, if you don't have an internet connection at home or you don't have the equipment, that, that's gonna be problematic. And I'll jump in here and uh, say, so, yeah, I mean, we run, we're on the other end of the spectrum when we're talking networking and social media and all that. A lot of the people we're dealing with are looking for entry level jobs or we've helped them pay for their training programs and now they're looking for a job because they have completed that training. A lot of people do not have the internet access and the problem, the compounded problem now is a lot of them would go to the library to use their computer systems and the libraries are closed as well. We have customers of ours telling us that they sit in the McDonald's parking lot to connect to the Wi-Fi. That way they can fill out applications and do some of the things they need to do. So on our end, I mean, the challenges are double. I mean, what are the jobs going to be? How many jobs are they going to be? Plus, and also a lot of our customers do not have, um, the IT tech savvy, nor the equipment to, to charge into this. So it's gonna be like a two-step process of possibly training people on what the equipment is and how to use it before they actually can take the next step and do the job hunting. I mean, we used to have a lot of events in our office where employers would come in and people would come in and do face-to-face -face interviews that day, those are gone. So. So we're trying to figure out what the new norm is that we're going to be able to help employers do their recruiting and also find jobs for the job seekers that are looking. So that's a perfect jump into our next topic of, step, of steps to take now. Um, Lauren talked about branding. Jim, Jim agreed with that. Charlotte, what, what do you advise employment seekers to do right now to assist with their employment? search? Well, I think, you know, really, uh, James and Lauren really talked about, um, I think a lot of that, uh, that people can do right now, as far as reevaluating uh, their cover letter, their resumes, uh, those are things that you can do right now. Uh, in addition to the networking, I mean, some of the opportunities to uh, Tony's point and Jane's point, I mean, all, all the folks on the panel is uh, making those connections with people that you know, and you will be surprised uh, with, the, um, with, the, um, with the information that people from your friends to your colleagues to your family members, that they have resources and they know of opportunities. Even at our uh, place of employment here, we give uh, referral bonuses to people who bring in good folks. So again, uh, if you're, you know, reach out to your family, your friends, your colleagues, and just ask, hey, do you know of opportunities? Are there opportunities where you work right now? So I would say to start to use that network uh, that you have access to right now uh, to find those opportunities. We, and I'd like to piggyback off of something that Jim said earlier about taking the time to look at your career goals long term and do an evaluation. Because right now with all of the job seekers on the market right now, there is a lot of competition. So it could be the perfect time to take a step back. And if you do have the desire to transition into something completely different, it's a great time to sharpen your skills uh, to uh, learn a, a, a new field, uh, go back to school, or if you just want to get to that next level, how do you make this the opportunity to uh, put yourself in the position so that in a few months you'll be at the top of the list um, by, by making sure that you have uh, the, the best skills possible. And Tabitha, uh, I just want to add right quick that uh, one of the 
you know, and I know the whole panel knows this, but we look for transferable skills. When people come in and they may not have the exact skill set, but they have transferable skills that we know will, will match kind of what the job responsibilities and job results that we're looking for. So again, take a look at what your skills are and see if you can translate that into opportunities that again, I think employers will, will also uh, consider. So I'm going to piggyback on what Lauren said. It all comes back to the money to people. And our programs, one of our target areas are dislocated workers where we can provide funds for them to receive training as they reevaluate their careers. Uh, we anticipate in one of the future stimulus bills that there's going to be a big increase in workforce training money. So there should be funds available uh, to help with that training as people move forward. What was being pushed before all of this happened is apprenticeship programs, which is perfect for people. It's a learn and earn at the same time. It's a combination of classroom training and on-the-job training. So I would anticipate seeing additional funds in that area as well as people look to move into other careers. And Tabitha, um, it, I, with regards to steps to take now, I'd like to say just something really uh, geared toward the employers out there. Um, in three economic downturns, what I've discovered is when the economy turns around, the companies that did not lay off their staffs performed better than companies that did not. And the reason for, and, and it's going to be even more evident now, um, because if the job market has been so tough to find new people, and it's going to be even tougher when the, I, I know that it doesn't look that way. It's like, oh, we've laid all these people off and look at all the people on the job market. I got to tell you, the people that um, are the, the skilled labor and whatnot, those people aren't getting laid off that readily. And it, it was already very difficult to get them in the first place, to train them, to develop them. And now you've laid all these people off and you end up with brain drain in your organization that may end up going to your competition if you're not careful. The Society of Human Resource Management did a survey on this a few years ago, and basically what they discovered is if you're laying people off and then have to rehire those positions later, the costs associated with that are 50 to 60% of, of that position's salary. So if you lay off 100 people, that's a lot of money that you're gonna lose, and they're talking about the recession, um, Jim Bullard, I think, did uh, talked about this a few Tuesdays ago, um, that we're not going to see as deep of a recessionary time as we saw in 2009 and 10, that it may come back in um, a couple of quarters. If that happens, then companies that have not laid their people off are going to be poised to really take advantage of it. I'm gonna give a shout out to two companies I know have taken deep steps not to lay their people off. That would be HTE Technologies in Maryland Heights and Barry Waymiller in Clayton. Um, just great examples of that philosophy and just great companies. So I wanna, I wanna be, we have a few questions in the chat and I wanna make sure we get to them. So, Let's, I do have a question that pertains to the forecasting for the future and then returning to work. So this kind of speaks to what you were just talking about, Jim. And I have to read it because this isn't one that I came up with. Um, but this comes from Greg Laposa, who's the Director of Workforce Development uh, for St. Louis County. And he says, looking ahead to economic recovery, how can the business community partner with our workforce development providers to ensure that we respond to the needs of workers who have been displaced. However, we also need to support the business in ramping up their operations again. So what is needed from our business community and then what is needed from our workforce development community? Happy to read it again if, if, if you need me to, that was a lengthy one. Yeah, could you read that again, Tabitha? Yes, ma'am. All right. So looking ahead to economic recovery, how can how can the business community partner with workforce development providers? What what does the business community need from the workforce development providers and then vice versa? So I'll take it a step further and broaden that definition of workforce development providers, including the education institutions, both the community college system as well as the four-year universities. 
I mean, I'm not sure if that if Greg was specific to our agencies or if he's looking at the bigger picture, but I think anything moving forward to really help employers and job seekers needs to be the bigger picture. Okay, and Bethany's going to put it in the chat box. So if anybody, if anybody wants to circle back and think about that one. Hey, Tabitha, I, what, what I'll mention to that is I think the business community really needs to communicate to those agencies and then those developers on exactly what do we need to run our business. And then maybe set up programs that are educational in nature or training in nature with those agencies and groups to help those people get those skills. In today's world, if you don't understand technology or how to use a computer or whatever, you're just shut out. And if you're going to go on to educational um, um, educational um, institutions and whatnot, it's the it's a responsibility of the business community to tell those institutions and tell those groups what we need. It's not their responsibility to try to figure it out. So I think that's the first thing that the business community needs to do. I will jump in here and say there's two phases here. I mean. I think we're talking about people coming into a business, but there is also um, something we call encumbered worker training programs where we take employees that are currently at a business and work and get them training to upskill them to move into the next level. And uh, in this case, it may be the technology things that people don't have is what they need in this day and age just to survive. So that that's an option as well when pe businesses think about training programs, it doesn't have to just be new employees. It's also current employees. I know there's a lot of uh, universities that are offering free online courses at this time that people can take if you have access to technology and you want to further your, your skills and, and plan out the next, you know, 90 days or, or how do you um, position yourself to be in a more uh, I guess this goes along with branding to, to be more of an asset to your company. You can definitely take advantage of those classes at this time. Um, how far in advance do you do you, do you all think? Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna point to Lauren on this one. When when we talk about planning ahead, what do you think that looks like? So if somebody has a job and they're uncertain as to what, what their future looks like. For the next 90 days, if we look at short term, what, what do you think that they should do during this time to properly plan for what could happen? Well, the most important thing is to make sure that you're communicating with your employer. So just like it's important for the employers to communicate with their team, it's just as critical for employees to take this opportunity to increase your uh, visibility in the organization and make sure that the people who make decisions know that uh, you add value, that they know what, um, what your goals are from a career standpoint. And so if you have interest in uh, a particular long-term career with this organization, uh, make sure you're connecting with your manager and with other leaders so that you have people that will go to bat for you when the tough conversations uh, might eventually happen and uh, you want to make sure that your name isn't on the list. It's just that important to make sure that everybody in the organization, organization knows that you're the person that uh, is adding value and uh, that has a future in the organization because just like Jim said, uh, there's a cost to hiring people back and especially a player. So um, if, if that's what you want yourself to be considered, making sure that you're very focused on number one, doing a good job at your day job and number two, focusing on your corporate visibility. Great answer, great answer. So before we close out, there are some questions in the chat that we want to ask our panelists. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bethany because she has been diligently following them um, that she can ask our panelists. Right, and the first one is from Dia Hoover. Um, and she said, 
that this was regarding one of the topics in the beginning of the conversation. Do I furlough my employees so they can draw unemployment? I will keep benefits in place. I don't want them to make less being paid by me versus the 2400 in addition to unemployment that will be paid. She said she owns two tour companies. What would you guys, you know, do you have any insight on her, her um, position? Well, first of all, what I would say is her fear is exactly right. Um, many, many people who have been laid off from their, from their organizations because of the stimulus package put in by Congress has um, drastically increased their earning potential um, being unemployed than being employed. And so the, the challenge that companies face is that if they lay their people off and try to hire them back, um, if that stimulus package is still in place, they may not be able to get them back because they may not want to stay. They may want to stay on that program until it runs out. And I, I know they put an end date on that, Bethany, but it's been my experience with the government. They, they're always changing and they may extend that just based on what they feel the economy is doing. So my um, best advice is to look at my business from an overall perspective, maybe get with my accountant and really figure out a strategy to keep that from happening, other cash saving strategies that you could use um, to, to avoid furloughing people or avoid laying them off. Great. Uh, any other one else wanna to add to that? Yeah, just one other thing that uh, is something to consider is if you reduce hours, uh, there, to Jim's point, you know, if you're working with either, you know, someone in finance in your organization or an advisor, you can do different scenarios. And by reducing hours to say 15 or something like that, then there's the potential that they can still do work for you, uh, but then also uh, get unemployment plus that $600. So there's a lot of different variants of how to manage that process. That's a great alternative. Um, okay, the next question is from Tim Dean. And he said, well, it's important to maintain current worker skills and mindsets, re-engaging everyone back to work will also be paramount. What do you see will be the critical roles needed to help readjust workers back to the workforce, especially those whose loyalties have may shifted to, to a different role or direction, as well as reinvigorating those who want to remain at your company? So I think it goes back to communication. I mean, I think you need to be communicating throughout this whole process. And I know in my organization, we have shifted from how do we work at home to starting to plan for when we come back because we deal with the public. So we need to have certain safety measures in place. So we're meeting with the right people, but the mind shift is shifted from how long do we stay home to when do we get back and how are we ready to go and make sure we have everything in place to make it successful? I, I would just say that <clears throat> you're really almost onboarding your, your folks again, uh, because I mean, you think they've been gone for maybe four weeks, maybe eight weeks. It, it could be 12 weeks. I don't know how long this shelter in place will last, uh, but you're really onboarding uh, your folks to get them reacclimated to, uh, to your culture, to your business. Uh, but, for us, safety is number one uh, in our organization. So you're really kind of onboarding and training folks again uh, in the process of uh, uh, reintegrating them back into the system. Yeah, and a lot of organizations are just gonna really have to think very carefully about how they're bringing people back. I saw there's a question about safety, so there's that piece. There's also um, just the fact that some people are going to wanna continue to stay home for a little while. Um, some organizations uh, we've got on the slide here, you know, remote work is now, I think, going to be a much broader uh, process for organizations to consider. And how is that going to affect the workplace culture? Um, because if people are working from home two days a week, then there's a lot of empty chairs in the office that's going to affect real estate. It's also going to affect the culture and the vibe in the office. So I think there's a lot of very strategic conversations that need to be had at this at the leadership level to make sure that um, that organizations are thoughtfully planning for the future. Yeah, and you know, just to piggyback on what Lauren said with respect to remote work, 
Um, I was recently on a call with the Precision Manufacturers Association. This is an association that represents thousands of manufacturers all over the country. And traditionally, these are not work from home people, right? It's like you show up at the plant and you do your precision metal stuff, whatever you're making, and then you go home at the end of the day. And there, th this was a meeting of CEOs, presidents, general managers, CIOs, and whatnot. And across the board, they've been forced to work in a distributed workforce fashion with um, collaboration with all kinds of technology from Zoom to Teams and and whatever your whatever your platform is and their opinion going forward is that this is their new normal and they've discovered better efficiencies and better collaboration not only with employees but even with their customer base um, and also cost saving structures not having to travel all over the place and and uh, the CIOs of these companies were just instrumental in making that happen so I think that yeah, if I was a real estate developer right now, maybe I'd be kind of worried about building office buildings <laughs> from now going forward. Okay, great. Thank you. I have a, another question from David Morris. Um, he said, a lot of trends we're discussing require job seekers to do more, such as apply online. Jim mentioned that the majority of folks looking for entry-level jobs don't have readily available access to internet, computer, smartphone. What adjustments do you see employers making in order to better accommodate to this segment of potential employees. Can I jump in and maybe correct some things? I don't know that it's the majority of entry level individuals looking do not have access to those things. I think in this day and age, a lot of people do. I mean, I, there are some who do not, but it's really not the majority. Mm -hmm. I think it's more of a, a mindset of how those jobs have been advertised before and how people got those jobs and how that's going to switch. I, I have to agree with Tony. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, individuals with significant disability that have access to the internet. Uh, they're probably sometimes more savvy <laughs> than I am uh, on, I mean, they have their smartphones, they, they're, they're on Facebook. Um, so again, it, a lot of times it's, it's in how we can communicate with them to ensure that they uh, understand the process uh, in uh, applying for jobs, uh, that we can communicate that training. A lot of times um, we do see individuals face-to-face. -face. We haven't been able to do that. Uh, so we have had to rely on um, uh, virtual uh, um, training and interviewing. And so uh, my team, we're making it work. So again, we've been placing people in the community even now in this pandemic. So, um, so again, people will start to adjust and people will make accommodations and people will figure things out. I do believe that. So um, I think uh, this pandemic has forced even from telemedicine or whatever the case may be, we are starting to figure out how are we gonna communicate differently moving forward. And so people will start to figure out how to make those adjustments and we will help them to figure that out for individuals with significant disability and people who have barriers to employment of how to uh, re-enter uh, the workforce. And I would hop back in here real quick and to employers say anything you set up, have it uh, available through a smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, the state of Illinois and their unemployment offices do not have that capability. People have to go to a computer to apply online we're not the agency that deals with it, but we've been dealing with a lot of unemployment issues, trying to be the go-between because there is no uh, ability for people to use their smartphone to complete the application. Great point. And we're gonna end on that note because we are one minute um, away. I just wanna say thank you again to our panelists, Charlotte, Jim, Tony, and Lauren, who is a board member of the Cygnus Regional Chamber, and to Bethany, Kelly, Mary, and Brittany at the Chamber for executing this webinar. This webinar will be sent out after we conclude. A big thank you to our sponsors, Technology Partners, and Kitty Academy, who is serving St. Louis healthcare and essential businesses in this time of crisis. We hope you join us on Tuesday at 10 a.m. for a policy briefing and next Thursday at 10 a.m. for our next webinar. You can find all the details and register online at the St. Louis Regional Chamber's website. Have a wonderful day.